In this video, I'm going to go over the practice PAT for matter and chemical change. Okay, so as I've said before, I think the best thing that you can do is try this PAT on your own and then follow along with me for any questions you might get stuck on. Okay, let's start off here with question number one. Which of the following rows identifies an element that is common to both combustion and corrosion reactions? and identifies whether the element is a reactant or a product of the reaction. So the first thing we need to figure out is what is a combustion or corrosion reaction. So a combustion reaction is just a fancy way of, of saying that it produces a lot of energy. So we can think of a fire or kind of more fun one, some sort of explosion that's happening. Now with corrosion, corrosion is just another fancy way of saying rust. So if we think about this, if we're going to burn something or something is going to rust, we need something um, to start off with. So that really means the element that it starts off with is going to be a reactant. So I can cross off any of the options that say product. Now we have to decide what element is it that's common to both of these. So for this actually, in order to have combustion or rust, you need oxygen. And the way I think about this is if you have a candle and you were to extinguish it by just putting a lid over it, well, you're going to remove all the oxygen on it and that's going to make sure the candle doesn't burn anymore. Or another example of that is like smothering a fire. Again, you're removing the oxygen so it can't combust anymore. So therefore, the answer to this is going to be option A, requiring an element of, an ox requiring an element of oxygen and using a reactant. Okay, number two here. So with this, we're looking at the physical properties of elements. So physical properties are anything that you can really see or are the actual properties of the element on its own. So we've got our melting point, boiling point, color, conductivity, and malleability. So we wanna know which of the following statements describes the conductivity of elements three and four. So one thing I noticed right away is with element three, we're saying it's not malleable. So to malle to, in order for something to be malleable, what it means is that we can bend it. So that means it's probably gonna be a property of a non-metal if it's not malleable, okay? And then with, our, with uh, option four, we're saying it's very malleable. So if it's very malleable, we can probably say that it's a metal. So now we have to decide which of these descriptions fit those options there. Well, both A and B are talking about insulators and conductors. Well, a metal is a very good conductor of both heat and electricity, and a non-metal is a good insulator. So in order to say both of them, that's probably not gonna work because we know that one is a non-metal and the other one is a metal. So I'm gonna cross off A and B. And then for C, we're saying element three is a good conductor. Well, element three is a non-metal. So as we said, a non-metal is not a good conductor. So that's not gonna work. And that leaves us with our final option. So element three is a good insulator. Yep, non-metals are often good insulators. And element four is a good conductor. Yep, metals are often good conductors. So this leaves us with answer D. Okay, number three. So with this question, we wanna know what is the chemical name of a molecular substance that is composed of one carbon and four chlorine atoms. So remember, a molecular substance is going to be two nonmetals. And the way I'm gonna show you that is if we kind of go into our periodic table, everything above that staircase is a nonmetal and everything below that staircase is a metal. So again, with this one, we're looking at carbon and chlorine. Those are both nonmetals. So that means when we name a molecular compound, we need to use our prefix, prefixes of these here. So in this case, I'm gonna write out the chemical formula. So the chemical formula is one carbon and four chlorines. So since we do need to use our prefixes, that means this one is going to have a tetra. And if we remember, a, if we remember the first element of a molecular compound, if it's a one, we don't need to add anything. So it can just stay on its own. So that means it's going to be carbon, which we can see here. And we said it's tetrachlorine. Well, we can't say tetrachlorine. We have to change the ending to I. So this one is going to be option B, carbon tetrachloride. Okay, number four here. So I pulled out the periodic table just to make this a little bit easier. 
So which of the following statements about helium, neon, and argon are true? So if we notice, all of those elements are in the same group. So groups go vertical, periods are gonna go horizontal. So these ones are in the same groups. And the reason we organize elements in the same group is because they react similar to one another. So that means the answer for this one is going to be A. They react with substances in a similar way. So we want to know which of the following events is an example of a chemical change. So I like to describe a chemical change as a change that once it happens, often you will not be able to get the original substance back. So let's try and see what's happening. Liquid nitrogen evaporates. Well, normally if something evaporates, you can find a way to get it back. Really all it's doing is changing from a liquid, in this case, to a gas. Uh, for option B, a candle burns. I do like that one. Once a candle has burnt a certain amount, the wax doesn't reappear, it's gone. So I do like that one. Option C, water boils. Well, that's the same idea. We're going from a liquid to a gas. And then option D is ice melting. That's kind of the same idea as what's called a phase change, which is what we're seeing for these. With ice melting, however, we're going from a solid to a liquid. So in this case, our option here that's going to work is going to be option B. Okay, number eight, we want to know which of the following substances is classified as a solution. So a solution is basically a mixture, and often the mixture looks like it's one mixture, but it's actually made up of two or more things. So I'm looking at my options here, and acid rain is a good option for this question because acid rain is normally made out of compounds like sulfur, nitrogen, and water. Table salt is still one compound, so that one's not gonna work. Helium gas, as it sounds, it's just one element, so that's gonna be helium. And baking soda, and baking soda again, just baking soda on its own. So our only option for this is going to be option A. Okay, number nine, a student tests the reactivity of four metals by placing each of the metal into a 200 gram per liter of hydrochloric acid. Each piece has an initial mass of four grams. The student records her observations in the following table. So before we get to our table, let's double check and make sure we understand what's happening here. So we have four grams of a metal and we're putting it in acid. So if it's a strong acid, what it's going to start to do is it's going to start to dissolve whatever is in that acid. So our question is asking us, the information in the table below shows that the metal that reacts most readily with hydrochloric acid is, and then we have our option. So how we know this is we're looking for the metal that has been almost dissolved all the way. So we're looking for the one that would have the lowest mass after its reaction with hydrochloric acid. So the lowest mass for this is going to be option C. So our answer is C. Okay, number 10. So with this one, what they did is they gave us a legend and we're saying that our hydrogen is the one with the little white circle, carbon is the dark circle, and oxygen is the gray circle. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm actually just gonna label everything with, um, label everything by using the key. So here is our hydrogen. And then our oxygens. And our carbons. Okay, so now that we have that cleared up, we wanna know what is the chemical formula for the unknown molecule above. Well, let's again, let's look at our diagram. So our chemical formula, this consists of two carbons and it consists of one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens and one oxygen. So now we just have to find one that matches that. Well, that's gonna be option C. So the answer for this one is C. Okay, number 11 here, so let's take a look and see what's going on. During a laboratory experiment, four students combined, four students each combined two substances and recorded their observations. So we've got all of this here. Let's read the question so we know what we're looking for. Which student most likely produced a new chemical substance? So in order for a new chemical substance to be made, what we're asking for is which one had a chemical reaction. 
because most likely if we had a chemical reaction, we probably produced a new substance. So um, what I want to do is quickly show you this. These are the seven indicators of a chemical reaction. If any of these happened, we can likely assume that a new product was made. So if we are looking at that, a clear liquid that remains at room temperature, well, that's not really any change. Nothing new is formed there. No changes in color, nothing that's the same. A blue liquid, again, not a change in color. A clear liquid that bubbles. I do like that because if we're seeing bubbles, that means there was gas produced and we see those gas in those bubbles. So that's quite an option. For um, uh, student number four, a white solid that floats on top of the yellow liquid. That one is tempting, but again, we don't see a color change, so that's not gonna work. So our option here is student three or C. Okay, number 12 here. So which of the following rows identifies both the elements and the total number of atoms present in one molecule here. So keep in mind it's a total number of elements. So I'm looking at this and I see one, two, three different letters. So that means my total number of elements is going to be three. So I'm going to cross off anything that is not three. Okay, now let's decide what are those elements. Well, my C is my carbon, my H is the hydrogen, and O is the oxygen. Now, they do try and trick you because they start to use helium instead of hydrogen. So just be clear that we know hydrogen is just an H on its own. In fact, it's the first element of the periodic table, so hopefully we can remember it just has one letter in it. And then our next one is helium, which is HE. So since I don't see any HEs here, our answer for this one is going to be option C. Okay, number 13 here. So the number of electrons in one beryllium, in one beryllium atom is blank. So I've zoomed in here on my periodic table here, and we know beryllium has an atomic number of four. So if it has an atomic number of four, that means it has four protons. So that means it's positive four. Now, in order to balance these electrons, or excuse me, in order to balance the positive protons, well, we also need four negative electrons. That's going to keep the atom nice and balanced. So to answer this question, the number of electrons in one beryllium atom is going to be four. Okay, number 14. So with this, I am gonna be looking at the small periodic table. Um, if you haven't looked at it, make sure you click uh, the link in the description where you can click on the actual periodic table that I'm looking at here, and it won't be um, so tiny or I won't be zooming in and out. But okay, let's look at the question. Um, which of the following pairs of elements have the most properties in common? So one thing we need to remember is in order for elements to have common properties, they're often going to be organized vertically with one another. They're going to be organized in those groups. So what we're looking for is a pair of elements in these options that are in the same group. So let's go ahead and let's look for that. So the first one is fluorine and oxygen. Well, fluorine and oxygen are right next to each other. So while they differ by one atomic number, they might not be the one that is most likely to have properties in common. The next option is B, fluorine and chlorine. Well, I do like that one because they are stacked right on top of one another. So that could be a good option here. And then our next one for C, it's sodium. So sodium is Na, it always confuses everyone. It's kind of hanging out here, atomic number 11. Na and neon. So neon's on the opposite side. So those are on polar opposite sides of the periodic table. Those probably don't have really much of anything in common. And then our last option is sodium and magnesium. So sodium is right here, number 11, and magnesium is right next to it. So again, if they're most likely to have uh, similar properties to one another, then they're gonna be stacked in that vertical group. So that's not gonna work, but it is gonna leave us with option B as our answer. Okay, number 15, which of the following rows classifies the type of compound formed when sodium and chlorine react together and states whether this compound conducts electricity when dissolved in water. So for those of you that don't know, sodium and chlorine is really just salt. They come together very, very nicely. So they come together in what's called an ionic compound. And with an ionic compound, what that means is the sodium has a positive charge and the chlorine has a negative charge. So to keep things simple, what they're gonna do 
is they're gonna do something called a swap and draw. So basically sodium takes the negative electron from chlorine and chlorine takes the positive proton from sodium. That then puts them in a bond, creating sodium chloride. What I'm gonna do is in the description below, I will put a link to a YouTube video that explains ionic compounds much better than I can explain it here. But what we do know is we've got sodium and chlorine coming together in an ionic compound. We also know it's a metal and a non-metal, also then telling us that it's an ionic compound. Now, what's interesting about ionic compounds is when they are dissolved in water, they do conduct electricity. So the answer to this one is going to be C. 16 here. So it wants us to know which of the following statements describes a physical property of a substance. Well, a physical property is really just a character characteristics, a characteristic of a substance that we can measure or observe. And what's happening is we're not actually changing that element. So a simple way I explain that is it's something we can see the element doing on its own. It doesn't really need to be reacting with something else. So if we look at option A here, it says hydrochloric acid produces heat when mixed with zinc. Well, again, if it's producing something when it's reacting with hydrochloric acid, that would not be a physical property. Option B, phosphorus burns when exposed to air. Well, again, you're talking about the phosphorus and you're exposing it to air. Those are two things that are coming together, not looking at the compound, not looking at the element on its own, sorry. Option C, lithium reacts violently with water. While this is really cool to watch, again, it's two things coming together to create a reaction, so it would not be a physical property. That's gonna leave us with option D, copper. Okay, we're looking at one element on its own. Copper conducts electricity. Yes, it does. We can measure it, we can see that, but we're not changing the copper on in any way, shape, or form. So for this one, it is gonna be option D. I just wanna take a minute here and say that we have three more to go and we are done with this one. Okay, number 17. Rutherford used the solar system as a model to explain the structure of the atom. When this model is compared to an atom, the planets represent. So this is really what he's saying, is that we have our sun, and then from there we have things that are orbiting around it, right? So we have to think back, well, what's gonna orbit the center of the atom. So if you remember for this one, it's only gonna be option D. It's going to be those electrons that orbit the atom. So they're just kind of hanging out and they're just gonna orbit the atom right there. So our answer for this is D. Okay, number 18. So we have a large portion that we need to read here. So I'm gonna read it first and then we're gonna go through and find out some of the important information. So a group of students conducts an experiment to determine the effect of temperature on reaction rates. They perform three separate trials in this experiment. In the first trial, they drop an anti-acid tablet into a beaker of water at a temperature of 40 degrees and record how long it takes for the tablet to completely dissolve. In the second and third trials, they use the same type of the same type and amount of anti-acid, but they change they change the temperature and the water to 25 degrees for the second trial and five degrees for the third trial. Okay, so lots of things in there that we need to keep track of. So the first thing that I want to keep track of is the five degrees for the third trial, 25 degrees for the second, and 40 degrees for the first. Okay, so what the question is asking us, they're asking us, what is the manipulated variable in this experiment? Well, if we think about it, when something is being manipulated or when someone is being manipulating, they are trying to change your mind for something. They're trying to change how you think or what you do. So in this case, we need to think, well, what did we change in this experiment? So the only thing that I see that we've actually changed, as I've highlighted, is the temperature. So that means our answer for this one is going to be option B, the temperature at which the reaction occurs. Okay, last question here. So numerical response number two, what we need to do is they've given us some elements and with those elements, we need, to, we need to decide which are going to be metals and which are going to be non-metals. So we have aluminum, fluorine, lithium, and phosphorus. So again, with something like this, we need to be very clear about where those metals and non-metals are. However, the names can also kind of give you a hint, right? So when we look at this, the first thing I'm looking at 
is I know aluminum, like aluminum foil, I know that that's gonna be a metal. So I'm gonna put a number one there. And let's double check our periodic table. If it is below the staircase, it's a metal. So there's my, sta my staircase right there, just in bold. And aluminum is number 13, right underneath boron, so it's definitely a metal. Let's look at our second one is fluorine. So fluorine is number nine right there. It's above the staircase. So that's gonna be a non-metal. So we're gonna pop the two there. Our third option is lithium. Well, lithium is hanging out right over there, number three. It is still below that staircase, even though it's on the left side of the periodic table. So that one is a metal. And our last one is phosphorus. Phosphorus, we can see, is right above the staircase at number 15. So this one is a non-metal, so we are going to pop a two there. So our answer for this numerical response question is one, two, one, two. I hope that was helpful. All the interactive tools to help you learn and study are in the description below. Just as a reminder, I do hold one-on-one -on -one sessions. You know where to find that information. And I will see everyone in the next video.